and forbid them not. For that's what the kingdom of God is like. And if you don't come like one of them, you ain't going to make it. If you'll forgive my inelegant translation. You have to come like a child. You have to simply trust them like a child. The Bible says in Psalm 127, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake him, but in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage from the Lord, or of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. Arrows are an important thing. We, they used them especially in those days in battle. They did things that the person couldn't do. They accomplished things the person couldn't do by their self. They went to places that the archer couldn't go by himself. But as Adrian Rogers pointed out, there's three things you have to do with arrows. You have to straighten them. If an arrow is not straight, it won't shoot straight. You have to straighten arrows. The Bible says we're to train up a child, and I hesitate to use that verse because um, people have beat people over the head with it. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. But we're to train our children. We're to help them to be cleansed through the word. Where, how can a young man keep his way clear, his heart clean, by trusting in the word? They arrows need to be straightened, they need to be sharpened. And again, that's by the word. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we need to feed in the word. And then, and this is the hard part, arrows not only have to be straightened and sharpened, but they have to be sent. You have to let them go. And that's hard to do. You have to send them out. And you have to prepare them before you send them out. And that's what um, we're called to do. I'm going to ask uh, Daniel and Holly to come stand here with Nellie. In case you were wondering, um, it's Eleanor, but I don't know if we'll ever call her that or not. We'll call her Nellie. But the most important element of raising a child is the family, the parents especially. And so Daniel and Holly, but to help Daniel and Holly, we've got, if y'all will stand, you don't have to come up here, but um, Granny and Nugs, uh, just stand up, just stand right where you are. Uh, Karen and Todd, I will always mother and dad have a responsibility. Uncle Hunter has a responsibility. And I had to look up to see what to call Gann, because all I call her is Gann. This is Shirley. Uh, Miss Shirley, would you stand up? They have a responsibility. Me and Gigi has a responsibility. So Gigi, you stand up. And Uncle Lee and Eric and Catherine and Kennedy have a responsibility. The family has a responsibility to raise up the child in the way that they should go, to train them, to pour into them God's Word, because there's so much other stuff out there. So will you, as the family, commit to pour into Nellie? <laughs>
the Word of God so that one day she will know the living Word of God. Will you promise? <laughs> Say amen or something. Amen. 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 All right. Next to the family is the church family. Would you stand? You have a responsibility to live for Christ, to live a life in front of her so that she can see your works. Jesus said, let your works be known before men that they might see your good works and not say how good a boy you are, but they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. So will you promise to pray for this family, to pray for her, to encourage her until one day she comes to receive Christ as Savior? Will you promise? Amen. 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 All right, let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would bless this family, bless Daniel and Polly, bless the extended family. Lord, we pray that you would bless our church family, that you would use us to draw Nellie to you. We know that there's nothing that we can do here, but we know that your spirit works and that through your word, we pray that one day she will come to know you as Lord and Savior. Be with us as a church family, as an extended family, as an immediate family, that we might live and that your presence would live in us, that she would see Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, while you're standing, if you want to <laughs> greet each other, you can do that. <laughs> oh, sorry. Wait, 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 wait. One minute, one minute, one minute. We got a... Uh, a little certificate Aww. for y'all and the little pile. Alright, and you can greet them and greet each other. <laughs>
way back to your seat and turn to number 342. We'll sing all three verses. Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me I should have told you this. 
flip over, if you will, from hold your finger because we're coming back to 2 Corinthians. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 8. If you know I'd end up over there. In Hebrews chapter 7, the writer tells us that we have a high priest, not like, well, one of the reasons I love Hebrews and I try to keep this brief. It's better. The book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews, and the writer of the Hebrews is writing to the Hebrews to tell them what we have in Christ is better than what we had in the old covenant. And so we have a better priest, not uh, a priest from the line of Levi, but a priest from the line of Melchizedek, an ever-living priest who lives to make intercession for us. And so he describes this covenant, this new covenant, in chapter 8 and verse 6. But now, this because we have this new high priest, he's obtained, or but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much more also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. We're already in the betters. We have a better mediator, a better covenant, based on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. For finding fault with him, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made for their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. The new covenant and the old covenant. And there's a contrast, and Paul makes some contrast here in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. The old covenant is legalistic, and the new covenant gives life. It, he says in verse 6, the old covenant, the letter, killeth, but the spirit gives life. He calls it in verse 7, the ministration of death, or the ministry of death. And the problem is with the, well, God didn't just redo the old covenant. He made a new covenant. A new covenant. Jesus fulfilled the old and brought in the new. And if we're in Christ, then Paul will tell us in a couple of chapters, we're new creations. The letter, and you've probably known some folks like this. Have you ever known any rules keepers? Somebody that had a list? Somebody that did this, did this, did this, did this? Or more importantly, they didn't do this, didn't do this, didn't do this, didn't do this. Homer and Jethro, an old country comedic group. They were the said they were the Everly Brothers of the Stone Age. But they used to say, I don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls that do. And that's keeping a list. And if you've known these people that try to keep lists, they're miserable. Because guess what? You can't keep the list. You can't do enough. You can't be good enough. You can't fulfill the law. Paul says in Romans 3, By the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified before the Lord. 
Nobody will be justified by the works of the law. In fact, Paul says in Romans 5, again, this is the Shelby translation, the law entered that you could keep score. Before the law came, Adam sinned, and then it was thousands of years before Moses came along. And Paul says in Romans 5, people didn't quit sinning from Adam to the time of Moses. They kept sinning. They just wanted a way to keep up with it. But when the law came, then you could keep score. Then you could tell who was doing what. Now, they were still doing wrong, even once it didn't sin the same way Adam did. They were still sinning. But the law entered that the offense might abound. And Paul says in Romans 5, this is that much more chapter, the law entered that sin may abound, but grace much more abounded. It is greater than our sin. Trying to keep the law, legalism kills. You've never seen a happy list keeper, a happy rules keeper, a happy self-righteous person. It always kills until we come to the end of ourselves and realize we can't do it and that Christ has already done it. That's what Paul wrestled with in Romans 7 and Romans 8. In Romans 7, he knows what the law says, and unless you think I'm throwing off on the law, the law is good. That's what Paul says in Romans 7. The law is good, and I agree that it's good, and it came from God. And Paul says here, the law was glorious. When it came, it was glorious. But Paul says, when I try to keep the law, I'm miserable. In fact, I think of what he's saying. At one point, I thought I could even keep the law. And I like it that he uses the last of the Ten Commandments. I wouldn't have known sin except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. That's number 10. All the rest of them, you can kind of justify yourself. Well, I love the Lord. I don't have an idol at my house. I go to church on Sunday. I keep the Sabbath. I honor my father and mother. I haven't killed anybody. I don't commit adultery. I haven't told a real bad lie that somebody would find out about. <laughs> um, I haven't um, done any of those kind of things. But then you get to 10, and you're not even supposed to cut it. You're not even supposed to want what somebody else has. And it goes through a list. Their wife or their servant or their house, if we could contemporize it, their car or their clothes or their job. And Paul says, I was alive once and then the law came and it killed me. The law kills, legalism kills and these false teachers, these Judaizers were trying to come into Corinth and they did to say, you still have to do something. I mean, Paul had an okay message. It's good to trust Christ, but you still need to keep the law. You still need to be circumcised. You still need to observe the Sabbath. You still don't need to eat what we're going to eat for lunch today. <laughs> And legalism kills. But we do the same thing today. Unfortunately, we could take a service like we had this morning and think that we're, and unfortunately, people do think that we're, by having a dedication service, that they're okay. Now the baby's saved. Now the baby's a Christian. No. We're dedicating ourselves to share Christ with her that when she can understand what the gospel says, when she can understand, my grandma's covering your ears here, I know you don't want to hear this. When she can understand that she's a sinner, she can be saved. And that's what the gospel says. It's not trying to prove that we can, it's understanding that we can't. And when we understand that we can't and we come to Christ, then the Spirit can 
and give us life. But we try to do that, don't we? Do you know Christ? Are you a Christian? Well, I got baptized when I was seven. I'm a member of the church down there. I always go when they have the Lord's Supper. All those things are good. I give, I go on mission trips. And all those things are good. But they're not good enough. And Jesus, most famous, I would say, sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, we call it. He gives the creed of the kingdom. He really explains the law further. It's not just have you killed anybody, it's have you been mad at somebody. It's not if you committed adultery, it's have you lusted in your heart. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, there's no way for you to get into the kingdom. Well, let me tell you, that's bad news. And I don't want to hurt your feelings, but the Pharisees and the scribes were outwardly more moral than I'm going to say any of us here. I hope that don't hurt your feelings. Outwardly, they, Paul could say, he was a Pharisee, according to the law, I was blameless. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong according to the law. And again, that letter of the law. And Jesus said our righteousness has, has to exceed that. We have to be better than that. And the bad news is we're not better than that. And the only way we can have a righteousness better than that is for him to give us his righteousness. There's nothing we can do. Legalism kills. The old covenant kills, but the new covenant gives life. Secondly, the old covenant is ritualistic. And the new covenant brings righteousness. Just as the old covenant can't save, the old covenant can't sanctify us. Us Baptists typically don't like that word, uh, to sanctify. But we should be sanctified. We should be, as Vance Havner told about a little boy in the church that came and as little boys are sometimes, he was a little terror. Just rowdy and a little boy. And his Sunday school teachers even sort of hated to see him coming. He was just a rambunctious little boy. And so he was absent from church for a good while. And so he said, I hated to say it, but we didn't miss him that much. He was just, you know, everywhere. And so finally he came back and he had a fiddle, a little fiddle case under his arm. And so the pastor asked him about it and said, where did you get the fiddle? And he said, somebody gave it to me for being good. Well, that shocked the preacher, apparently, the expression on his face. And the little boy said, you see, I'm gooder than I used to be. And by the grace of God, we should be gooder than we used to be. We should be growing. The law can't save and the law can't make us better. In fact, it's just the opposite. The law is like a mirror and when we look into it, we see our shortcomings. We see our sinfulness. And that's, again, what Paul says in Romans 7. I knew what the law said. I agreed that the law was good and I knew what it said to do. And the more that I tried to do that, the more that I did something else that I didn't want to do. And finally, at the end of chapter 7, he just almost throws up his hands. Who will deliver me from this body of death? This dead old man that's strapped to me that I can't get rid of. And thankfully, he said, who and not what? It's Christ that can deliver us. Paul was zealous for the ritual. 
but when he met Christ, Philippians 3, we looked at that passage last week, Paul named all the things he had on the plus side. If anybody could be good enough, I was good enough. I came from the right family. I went to the right church. I observed all the things I was supposed to observe. But when I found Christ, I counted all those things lost. In fact, not just lost, but the King James says dumb, refuse. Not the bad things that I did, the good things that I did. I counted a loss that I might gain Christ. John MacArthur says the old covenant commands righteousness. The new covenant confers it. The old covenant made people hearers of the truth. The new covenant enables them to be doers of the truth. Did you know that's what we sang about? Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. I think it was the second verse. Let the water and the blood from my wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Saved from wrath, we're saved by the blood of Christ. But as Paul told the Galatians, we don't get saved by grace through the blood of Christ and then we're able to live like he wants us to. Saved from wrath and make me pure. That's the only way that we can live is through the blood of Christ. It's his righteousness in us. Thirdly, the old covenant is passing away and the new covenant is permanent. We'll look at this in a little more detail last week. Paul says the, the old covenant was glorious. The law when it was given was glorious and it was glorious but it was designed to pass away. He says in verse 7 he just talks about the face of Moses. That was one of the things I did like about the old Ten Commandments movie. When Moses came down off the mountain, his face was shining. There was something different about Moses. And the Bible says in Exodus 34, this is when he came down the second time. He, God hewed out the tablets. Moses carried him up the mountain and he got the law of God written on both sides. And when he came back down the mountain, the Bible says, the people said, whoa, he has been with God. I mean, his face is shining. And when we read that in the Old Testament, it's almost as if they said, Moses, you got to put a veil over your face. We can't stand to look at you because your face is shining so much. And the Bible says when Moses talked to the people, he covered his face. But when he went to see, speak with God, he uncovered his face. But Paul tells us here, Moses covered his face when he was talking to the people so they couldn't see the glory was fading away. The old covenant is fading away. It was designed to fade away. It was designed to point out our sin. It was designed for us to see that we couldn't make it. The old covenant, the thunder and the fire, if you remember some of the videos we watched about the Holy Land, some people believe the, the place there that some call Sinai, the whole top of the mountain is black. It's different than all the others. It looks like there's been a fire up there. We don't know for sure if that's the place or not, but that would match with what the Bible says. The whole top of the mountain was on fire and there was smoke and they were scared to get close to the mountain. And they told Moses, you go talk to God and we'll stay down here. Paul says the new covenant is even better than that because it doesn't fade away. The glory, Paul says, of the new covenant is so much greater than the glory that was seen at the mountain. It's not even, verse 10 says, really not even worthy to be compared the glory, and it's so glorious 
Because that's how we're saved. The new covenant. We don't have the frustration of not being able to measure up. Of not being able to make it. Because we can't make it. Again, we saw them this morning. It's not the labor of my hands that can fulfill the loss of my hands. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. It's so glorious because it's the way that we receive the righteousness of God. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 9, it's only by the shedding of blood that there's the remission of sins. But he says it's not the blood of bulls and goats. It's not the blood of those animals. It's not the sacrifices that the priest made over and over and over and over and over again. That just reminds you that you're a sinner. But when our high priest went into the Holy of Holies, the heavenly Holy of Holies, he didn't go in with the blood of bulls and goats, but he went in with the, his own blood. And he didn't have to go in and first offer a sacrifice for himself because he was already perfect. And he offered his blood as the payment for my sin. And because of that, Paul says he's the, or the writer of Hebrews says, he is the mediator of a better covenant. I know some of you are familiar with a mediation. And Moses was a mediator. Joshua, to some extent, was a mediator. The priests were mediators. The prophets, in some sense, were mediators. And we have friends, maybe, who might be a mediator that you ask to pray for you. But they're, what a mediator does, supposedly, Eddie, you can correct me here if I'm wrong, is supposed to be, he understands both parties. He sees what's going on with both parties and he tries to bring them together. Well, the problem with Moses is he could understand man's side because he was a man. He could understand how sinful man was because he killed somebody before he left Egypt. He had gotten mad. He could understand man's side. But even though the Bible says there was nobody like Moses who God spoke to as a man speaks to his friend, he couldn't understand God's side. He was a good mediator, but he couldn't understand God's side. And that's why we have to have a new mediator and a new covenant with better promises because we have a mediator. The mediator of the new covenant can understand God's side because he's God. And praise God he can understand our side because he became as one of us. He became a man. Paul tells Timothy there's one God and there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. And because of that we can come to him. Why would anybody want anything different? Why would you want to depend on yourself? Why would you want to depend on your good works? Pride. I like having a little something to do with it. God is telling Abraham in Genesis chapter 17 about the new covenant. Or the covenant that I'm going to make with you. I'm going to make a covenant with you, Abraham. I know you're 99 years old, but you're going to have a child. You and Sarah are going to have a child. And through that child, I'm going to bless the whole world through you. And you know what Abraham said? I don't hear this verse read a lot, but it sticks out to me because it's, it's what we try to do. Abraham prayed, Oh, that Ishmael could walk before you. You know who Ishmael was? Ishmael was the child that Abraham had. 
It was Abraham's work. It was Abraham's idea. It was Abraham's plan. And what Abraham is saying, isn't my work good enough? Can't you use the works of my hand? Can't you use my plan, my purpose? Can't you use my work and effort? And God says, no, I can't use that. The child you're going to have is the child that I promised, is the child that I delivered. But oh, we want us to count for something. I'll close with this example. I've used it several times. But we got some visitors, so I'm going to pick on some of them today. Since it's Pastor Appreciation Day, we're going to have, I'm going to pick on Mr. Thorne. Let's say Brother Don comes up to me after the service today and says, Brother Eric, I just appreciate you. You just, you just doing so good. The message was just wonderful. And because it's so wonderful and it's Pastor Appreciation Day, out here under the shed, there's a, well, there's a brand new, not brand new, there's a fully restored frame off restoration Jeep CJ7. Not like the old one I got. This one, everything works on. <laughs> and I've had it beautifully restored. And it actually cost $100,000. And I would like to give you that Jeep for you to have and ride around just for you. And what if I was to say, oh, brother Don, you can't do that. That's too extravagant a gift. Let me help pay for it. And if my wife let me have any money, I'd reach in my pocket and get a quarter and hand it to brother Don. Here you go, brother Don. Thank you so much. And then I'd get into that Jeep and take off down the road. I'd get up there at 280 and somebody would stop me and say, Man, that Jeep is, looks really great. Where did you get that Jeep? I said, Oh, me and Brother Don bought that. <laughs> he paid $99,999.75. And I paid a quarter. But we bought it. You know what we try to do? Jesus Christ came not just to be the mediator of the new covenant, but to be the new covenant of grace. And do you see what we do to grace when we try to pitch our quarter in? It's only by his grace, and that's why it's such a glorious new covenant. Not by what I do but what Christ has done. That's glorious. That it doesn't depend on me. It depends on Christ who paid it all. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the new covenant in Christ. We thank you that it's more glorious than anything that we could do or say. More than any righteous act. More than a dedication, more than baptism, more than the Lord's Supper, more than any work that we could do. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, but if we are in Christ, if we receive Christ, you made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. Lord, draw us to you. Help us to see our sinfulness and the glory of Christ and the new covenant. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have our hymn of invitation. If you have a decision that you need to make, would you come as we stand and sing?